If you'd like to show that two spaces are homotopy equivalent, the most important thing you need is a tool for deciding when two maps are homotopic to one another because definition reduces to showing that certain composites are homotopic to the identity. Our goal in this lecture is to see one of the most powerful tools for deciding whether two maps are homotopic or not. It's not as well known as it should be, so we're going to take, um, uh, take our time understanding the statement and the proof of uh, this result, which is known as the carrier map. So let's uh, set things up. So K is a simplicial complex, and X is a topological space which need not be the realization of a simplicial complex. So here is the main object definition. A carrier, and uh, implicitly, uh, I mean a carrier for the simplicial complex K in the topological space X is an assignment which goes from uh, simplices sigma in K, and I'll call this assignment C, to subspaces C sigma of X. So just topological subspaces, um, so that it respects uh, various partial orders on the left side and on the right side. So this assignment C uh, satisfies if sigma is a face of tau in K, then the subspace you allocate to sigma is a subset of the subspace you allocate to tau in X. So that's the basic definition. So I'll call that A. Um, and for our purposes, it's um, it's important to see what this definition, how it relates with things we already know, like continuous maps and simplicial maps and so forth. So we say that C carries a map, a continuous map, uh, let's say F, from the geometric realization of K to X, if for all simplices, sigma in K, we have the inclusion or the containment, the F image of the realization of that simplex sigma must be a subset of whatever C has decided uh, sigma gets. And you can do something entirely similar for homotopies. We say that C again carries a homotopy. So a homotopy looks slightly different uh, than a map. It's going to be some theta from not just K, but K cross 0, 1 to X. If for each T in 0, 1, the map, let's say theta T from k to x given by the obvious thing. So theta t of some point in k is going to be theta of that point t. Uh, so this map, so for each t you get an ordinary continuous map from the realization of k to x, and we'll say that c carries the homotopy if it carries these t-wise maps for every possible t. So not too complicated, hopefully. So this is carried by theta in the sense of B, where B is the, the previous statement, where it's just carrying an ordinary map from K to X. So it has to contain the image uh, theta T U. OK, good. Now. Um, now here's the here's the main uh, result. So this is big. This is what I was. Uh, uh, this is what was promised as a big tool for detecting when two maps are. Um, this is called the carrier lemma. And what 
is important to note as I write down and, and describe the statement is the absolutely crucial role played by contractible spaces. So here's the carrier lemma. Let C be a carrier for K, which is some simplicial complex, in X, which is some topological space. If, and this is the big if, for each sigma in K, the subset C sigma of X is contractible, i.e. homotopy equivalent to a point, then three glorious consequences follow. So here's the first one. Uh, there exists a continuous map uh, from the realization of K to X carried by C. Okay, good. So um, you get for free that there is some map as long as these images are contractible, C sigma is contractible for every sigma in sight, you will get a map that's carried by C. B, uh, these maps cannot differ uh, homotopically. So what that means is, uh, so, so the previous statement said there exists, it didn't say there was only one, there could be several maps carried by C, but for all F, G, K to X carried by C, there exists a homotopy theta from um, k cross 0, 1 to x between f and g also carried by c. And so if you stop and stare at this statement, there are, um, there are amazing consequences that you can uh, you can derive just by reading through what all of this means. Uh, so to each simplex, you assign a contractible subspace of X, and then uh, you get for free that there's a there's a continuous map that that is carried by this carrier. And two, no matter what continuous map you chose, any two of them are related by a homotopy. So for instance, if X itself was contractible, rather than all these little pieces C sigma, then you could just assign the carrier, which sends every simplex to all of X. This is, you cannot fail. This carries every possible continuous map from the realization of K to X. And it turns out that any two of them, if you believe this statement, will be contractible, uh, will, be, will be homotopic to each other. So if X is contractible, then the image of any map into X, the, you know, any two maps you take into X are homotopic. So that's kind of cool. Um, okay, so uh, my goal is to sort of describe why this um, why this statement is true. We're going to work through a proof, uh, but A has been assigned as an exercise for this course, so I'm only going to show you B. A is strictly easier than B. If you understand the proof of B, A will follow sort of much more easily. Okay, so we only show B here. Proof only for B. Okay, now uh, the proof, um, I've seen a few proofs of this result. Like I said, it's not as well known as it should be. Almost all the proofs are inductive in some way. Um, and, and the way to proceed is to take your simplicial complex K and index the simplices in a nice way. So let sigma one, sigma two, up to sigma big N be an indexing. of the simplices of K so that, um, uh, which respects the face partial order, right? So that faces appear before simplices. So one way to do this, the easiest way to do this is if you take all the zero dimensional simplices, all the vertices and throw them in the first so many slots. Um, so those are all, none of them can be a face of each other. So those are all in the beginning. Then take all the one dimensional simplices, throw them all in in some order, I don't care which. And then when you look at one of those one dimensional simplices, what are its faces? Well, two vertices. And then you go back and of course, all the vertices were included before any of the edges showed up. 
So all, um, all of those will be there. Then you throw in all the two simplices and so on. Okay, so you order them like this, and this produces a filtration. A nested sequences, uh, a nested sequence of subcomplexes, uh, which I'll write as S I K, uh, which is defined to the, be the union of J less than or equal to I of simplex index J. So S one of K is just the simplex sigma one. S two of K is a simplice sigma one sigma two. S three is sigma one sigma two sigma three. Hopefully you understand. And because um, all the faces have to be there already when sigma i is introduced. Uh, you know that this is always going to produce a subcomplex of k. So this is for all, not j, but i in the set 1 through n. And when you, when you reach n, when you reach s big n of k, that, that's every simplex in k has been included. So you've reached the top, and that's, that's k. So this is a, this is a nice um, filtration. And the basic idea of the proof is to proceed by induction on I. And I will do this. Now, induction has two steps, the base case and the inductive case. And I would like to split the inductive case into two pieces because they're sort of involved. So uh, there, will be, there will be three parts. Uh, the base case is fairly nice. So one base case, which is to say i equals one. So let's let's worry about this first. So um, when i equals one, sigma one must be. Uh, remember, all the faces of sigma one should have appeared before sigma one, which is to say sigma one can have no faces other than itself, which means sigma, sigma 1 must be a vertex. Okay, so um, now what we need is two maps. So assume f sigma 1 and f sigma 2, sorry, not sigma 2. Uh, there are two maps, f and g, and they're defined on sigma 1. So g sigma 1. Uh, are carried by C sigma 1, right? That's what this means. Um, okay, well, sigma 1 has its realization being just a point. Um, and so F and G are taking this point and throwing it somewhere inside the contractible set C sigma 1. We've seen this before. So here's C sigma 1. Um, here is a single point f of sigma 1 because sigma 1 is a vertex. Here is a single point g of sigma 1 because sigma 1 is a vertex. And we've already proved in the last lecture that there exists a path. So by the argument of the previous lecture, To be precise, that for C sigma 1 contractible, any uh, map from the boundary of uh, the hollow 1 simplex, sorry, the, the hollow 1 simplex uh, to C of sigma 1 can be extended. to a map delta 1 to C sigma 1. OK, so how do you get that extension? Well, there's a path, and then you just assign these uh, the points between 0 and 1 to that path. So great. And the important thing is that that entire path lies in C sigma 1, which means that so far we have a homotopy. So uh, this gives a homotopy from f to g lying, uh, sorry, carried entirely uh, by c. 
Uh, and this f to g, of course, uh, restricted to the subcomplex uh, S1 of k, because we've only ever done anything with C sigma 1. We don't know anything about what f and g are supposed to do to the higher simplices, but that's okay because this is just the base case. Good. So, so far the base case was just reiterating an old argument that we've already made in the previous lecture. So, inductive case. Part one. Well, how do you induct? Uh, you assume that things hold for i minus one, and then you try to uh, show that this implies that they must also hold for i um, itself. So assume that the restrictions f g from s i minus one k. 2x admit a homotopy theta which must go from s i minus 1 k cross 0 1 to x that is carried by c. What we want is to show that theta extends to s i k cross zero one uh, while still being carried by c. Um, so we already have theta defined on most of everything we need. We have it defined on s i minus one k uh, to x. So this case applies for i bigger than one uh, because i equals one. We've already handled upstairs. So uh, we want to show that theta extends to this s i k cross zero one, and the difference between s i k cross zero one, where we don't have theta defined yet, is the image of um, the new simplex that you had to add to s i minus one k to get s i k, which is just sigma i by our um, by our uh, definition of s i k. So what we need need to define theta on this new bit, which is sigma i cross zero one. Okay, I, um, there, there are several ways that you could think about this product of sigma i's realization with zero one. And what I'd like to focus on here is just um, what this space looks like. What is a simplex cross zero one? And so um, anytime I have uh, a proof like this, I try to see a picture. Uh, so e.g., since I want to draw a picture, assume that dimension of sigma i equals 2. So it's, uh, it's, some, uh, it's some 2 simplex. Let's draw it like this. So this is sigma i, the, or the realization thereof. And because it's a 2 simplex, maybe I should fill it in. There you go. Um, and I want to cross it with the unit interval. So I guess that means I have to draw uh, all of this. And there's another copy of, um, uh, of the unit interval. And so all of this is present. This is a solid object. Uh, this is a genuinely 3D object. You've taken a two-dimensional object, which is sigma i's realization. Uh, which is at the bottom right here. I'll shade it again, just so you know. And this is uh, the zero one direction. Okay, now where on this do we have information? Which is to say, uh, which part of this is theta already defined on? So if you look, um, here is the boundary. So let's let's highlight in, in some color, I guess, uh, red the boundary of sigma i. Those are all the faces of sigma i. And here, because these were already present in s i minus 1 by our law on how s i was created, we know that, that theta is defined on that cross 0, 1. So, um, so there's, there's these lines coming up. Um, and, and for example, 
uh, let me shade just one of them, this entire face, uh, this two-dimensional piece, you know that theta is defined. Similarly, this two-dimensional piece, you know that theta is defined. Um, you also know what happens at the top and the bottom. The top and the bottom are, are um, F restricted to, um, uh, because theta is, is a homotopy from F to G, uh, when you plug in T equals zero, you get F of sigma I, and then the top you get G of sigma I. Okay, so what this means is that out of this solid, this piece of solid cake, we know on the surface where all the frosting might go, um, the, the values uh, either assigned by theta or F or G. So the boundary of sigma I cross zero one, looks like this. Um, uh, I'll, I'll draw it like it's basically the, the, um, the, the set I've already described. It's, it's, the, it's everything on the outside, not the solid stuff. Um, but there's a sort of convenient uh, description, which is you take all the horizontal stuff and all the vertical stuff separately. So let's do that. This union um, this, uh, and I guess there's a, so, so we're, we're separating the horizontal part. So this is everything without the top and bottom caps. And then here are the top and bottom caps. Um, so you can write this as, um, The hollow simplex defined by sigma i, the boundary, cross zero one. And this part of the union is two copies of sigma i's, sigma i cross zero and one. Okay, and now uh, the point is uh, we, can, we can start the second step by knowing things about theta and f and g on these two pieces of the boundary. So inductive step part two. So by the inductive hypothesis, um, theta is defined on del sigma i cross zero one um, and sends all of this set to C of sigma i. Um, why does it send it to C of sigma i? Because it sends, for example, every face, let's say tau of sigma i, um, it is contained in C of tau. It carries, it's carried in C of tau, but by our definition of a carrier, C of tau, when tau is a face of sigma i, must be contained in sigma i. So each of the faces of sigma i, uh, the homotopy is defined there and it's carried by C, and therefore when you take the union of all of them, it's still carried by C and it takes values now in C of tau, um, which is contained in C of sigma i for all the tau. Okay. Also, um, on the second piece, we know that um, theta on uh, sigma i cross zero and sigma i cross one must equal f and g respectively. This is by the definition of what it means for theta to be a homotopy. Okay, so theta is defined on all pieces of the boundary that the, the left side, actually, I should, I should probably say that this is the back of one of the faces. So, so that's a, that's a ribbon. And those are the, the other pieces, the top and the bottom. Okay, so it must equal F and G. And of course there, um, because F and G are carried by C, we know that F, G images of this boundary lie in C sigma I. Okay, so if you combine all of this stuff that we've learned about the boundary 
so let's put all of this together. We have a continuous map uh, from, uh, from the boundary of sigma i cross 0, 1 to the contractible set C of sigma i. And what we want is to extend continuously, of course, to all of sigma i cross 0, 1. OK, and now is the last piece of the puzzle, um, which is to realize so here's the key, is to realize that sigma i, the realization of this cross 0, 1, if dimension of sigma i equals d, is homeomorphic to uh, the solid d simplex cross 0, 1, which is homeomorphic in turn to the solid d plus 1 simplex. And it's for exactly the same reason that, for instance, a triangle, this is delta 2, is homeomorphic to delta 1 cross 0, 1, which is a square. OK, so once you've realized that there is a homeomorphism here to uh, not a product of a simplex with an interval, but just to a higher simplex, then you can use what we know about uh, contractible sets, which is the images of any simplex, um, and the boundary of any simplex. If you have a map defined there, then you can extend it to the whole simplex. So to end um, the argument, we use the contractibility of C of sigma i to get the desired continuous extension to sigma i cross 0, 1 of theta. So we've taken everything we knew about the values of sigma on the smaller set, uh, S i minus 1 cross 0, 1, and we added a single simplex to it, and it turns out that because simplex cross 0, 1 is just a higher simplex, uh, and C of sigma i is contractible, we can get the extension that we need. So now we've defined theta on S i plus 1, if we had it, oh, sorry, on S i, if we had it on S i minus 1. And so by induction, you can work all the way up to n. And that's the end of the proof. So, um, OK, maybe this argument was difficult. Maybe you'd want to watch it several times. Maybe you'd want to read the lecture notes slowly and carefully while sipping whatever your favorite beverage is. Um, what, what you should do now is try and think about a few uh, consequences. Um, my favorite one is, uh, is purely in the category of, um, uh, of just simplicial uh, objects, so simplicial maps. So here we had, uh, if you go back to the statement of the carrier lemma, and I know it was a while back before we saw it. Scroll, 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 scroll. OK, here we go. Um, this is about simplicial complex and then arbitrary topological space. We're looking at maps from the realization of k into some x. And now, uh, what we'd like to do is sort of specialize that x to also be a simplicial complex. So let's see what that looks like. So here's, here's a lovely application. Uh, corollary. If f and g from k to l are two simplicial maps, so that for all sigma in k, the union f sigma cup g sigma is a simplex of L. Then the induced continuous maps f and g are homotopic. 
And if you'd like to prove this, you just let C of sigma be the union simplex. Um, so the realization of F sigma union G sigma. This is a carrier. Uh, this, what, what I want to say, this carries both F and G by definition. And C sigma is just a solid simplex for each sigma, hence contractible. So an easy application of this result is that every cone on a simplicial complex is contractible. So application, every cone is contractible. And to see why, uh, why this is the case, so you take some simplicial complex K, uh, maybe I should actually make it a simplicial complex. Um, and then you make a cone over K. And note if you let F from cone K to cone K be the identity map, and G from cone K to cone k be the constant map sending everything to the new vertex v star then f sigma union g sigma always lies in cone k so you apply the previous result and you get a homotopy from um, the identity map from identity to uh, uh, to constant, which means that no matter what k you chose, we haven't really used that structure of k anywhere. The cone over k is going to be contractible. And this was the second family of examples we discussed when talking about contractible spaces. Great. So this was a lot, I know, but it's worth it. So I hope you'll spend some time to uh, study this material.